Welcome to the 2023 edition of the Canadian Public Health Association's Infectious Disease and Climate Change Forum. My name is Ian Colbert and I am CPH's Executive Director. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that while we are all gathering on this virtual platform from different parts of Turtle Island, CPHA's offices are located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. They have been the guardians of this land for millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples, and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. We are pleased to offer simultaneous interpretation for all sessions during this forum. To enable interpretation, simply click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and then select the language of your choice. This forum is a key knowledge exchange event for public health and allied health professionals, researchers, policymakers, academics, students, and trainees committed to sharing their research, best practices, and policies to deal with the impacts of climate change on infectious disease, and more broadly on the health of everyone in Canada. We hope that this year's forum will provide the opportunity to engage public health leaders, local organizations, and other partners from within and outside of the health sector to explore different perspectives on and the social impacts of climate change and infectious, infectious disease, and to provide a platform to come together and discuss the, to discuss the uh, gaps and opportunities in these areas. Now, to open the forum today, we are very pleased to welcome Brett Hewson, who will be talking to us about land and health. Brett is a writer and scholar who focus, uh, focuses on ecology, epistemology, and pedagogy within Gitsan society. He is a research associate with the Prairie Climate Center at the University of Winnipeg, the author of Mothers of Cizan, sorry, Sand series of children's book, uh, an artist, and a member of the Science Committee for Adaptation Futures 2023. Welcome, Brett. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to open up my uh, presentation here. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes, looks wonderful, Brett. All right. Amahiluk, good morning. Um Hetkum Sketwai, Lachsintich Wood Kalhuxli, Wilf Gutkunuch with the Witwi. Um my name is Hetkum Sket, uh, also known by my government name of Brett Hewson. I come from Gitchsan Lachyip, which is in the northwest interior of uh, what the settlers call British Columbia. Um, I'm author of the award-winning series Mothers of Khsan, which is uh, uh, a series of stories that help uh, young people to learn about the interconnectedness of uh, the world and the ecology from where I'm from. So hopefully that inspires them to look into the, the interconnectedness of the world that they live in. Uh, if you want to know more about the territories that you're living within, uh, you can go to native-land.ca. It's a great resource. It's not 100% accurate, but it's one of the most comprehensive resources that I have seen. And it gives you a little bit of a glimpse of land use before colonization. So <clears throat> uh, to go back, I want to go back a little bit to kind of uh, look at the, the storied history behind uh, my peoples. So 30,000 years ago was the uh, last glacial maximum. And during this period, the ice began moving down. We called this the time we lived under the ice. So it was pushing us from our territories further to the coastline, uh, where we lived along the south coast with uh, other nations. Uh, so we had to build relationships out of necessity. Uh, so around 15,000 years ago, the ice began to recede. And it was around 13,000 years ago, we were, able to, we were able to move back to our territories to reestablish the city of Dem Lahamid. So this um, movement of ice, this uh, melting of ice, created many new pathways, waterways, uh, fresh water, 
the ocean levels were dropping, uh, the, ec the ecology was changing, as well as the, the, the species within the territory were, were also changing to the, the climate itself. And uh, one of those things that came through to us uh, was the ulican. So the ulican are incredibly valued resource to the people of the Pacific Northwest. Um, coming out of a uh, very big change to our whole ecosystem um, brought many things. So with the ice melting, there were a lot of freshwater tributaries going into the ocean, a lot more than they normally were. So this uh, created a boom of uh, ulican because they love to breed in brackish water where the, the fresh meets the uh, salt water. And through this, uh, there was a boom that happened. So people valued the health component of the fish itself because we knew that our bodies needed uh, all that came through it. So, you know, there's the protein and of course there's a lot of the fatty acids. There's a lot of things and nutrients that come out of the fish itself. So people traded with it. So this presented a huge economic boom for us. Uh, so we were trading all over <clears throat> the, the coastline, even inland. So this, the grease trails moved uh, as far east to to Ontario um, the trade for the the Greece but also down to the south so they're moving over uh, vast expanses of territory uh, provided a lot for different nations and remnants of this trade actually uh, is shown in the state of Oregon uh, it was called the Ulican coast but uh, when settlers arrived uh, they were talking to some of the people from uh, who they were using as guides, and they couldn't pronounce uh, the uh, the R's, uh, or sorry, the L's, the way that we did, because of their language. So they would pronounce it Urican. Uh, so the Oregon coast is actually the Ulican coast because that's one of the main trading hubs of all the peoples on the coastline. So <clears throat> through change and adaptation. There was a lot of relationship development, uh, but also the only way that we were able to adapt was having a deep understanding of the land, uh, but also giving back to the land to ensure that uh, there was future returns. So we didn't live uh, on an extraction only basis, which is the way that the world is operating now. We didn't extract on human standards. Um, a lot of this was connected to our spirituality uh, our ways of knowing the world. So spirituality for us is an exchange of energy. Um, so knowing our place in the ecosystem, uh, knowing that all beings are connected and uh, what we do is to, pr uh, to protect all of the things that sustain us. So we had to have this really deep understanding of how the world was interconnected because it was the only way that you survive for tens of thousands of years uh, living in one place. So the knowledges of our world, although they didn't, we didn't understand the microbiological processes, we understood things on a macro level. So uh, my people in particular, we revered spider, we revered Gedele. Uh, the spider for us was the being that connected all things within our land, connected our whole world. And you would find spider webs all over the place. But also when we would uh, be doing our, our gardening practices, our agriculture, uh, harvesting, when we were doing anything on the land where it required us to go through the soil, we started to see <clears throat> what we thought were spider webs or what we told the story of as spider webs. Of course, that is the mycorrhiza, uh, the mycorrhiza, the, the mycelium that connects all the world. So in our stories, we say that spider is how the, the, the world communicates with one another, how the the plants can understand us or how the plants can connect and talk to one another was through the spider. So what does the modern science say about what we observed? Uh, the same things. It's like, oh, what does this mycorrhizae do? It helps the plant life communicate with one another. Uh, so indigenous knowledges are something that we can really, really utilize in many different ways, including how to tell the story of what we know to everybody so they understand it better. So viewing every aspect of life as a living and breathing entity is not just 
to serve a religion uh, as it has been described by Western anthropologists, but rather uh, to distinguish the importance of respect, rights, and protection that all precious resources need to be preserved for many generations to come. So basically, <clears throat> how we interpret the, the world was not exactly the way that the priests who translated our languages understood, because they only understood things in, from a religious perspective. So the interpretations of our languages, uh, there was a lot lost in translation. So our ways of knowing the world also changed the way the world looked at food. Agriculture was a very powerful tool for many Indigenous peoples. Uh, the Indigenous people changed the, they shaped the food on their lands to meet the needs of the people, but also at the same time, making sure that it didn't harm the eco ecological processes. So things like tomatoes, chili peppers, potatoes, squash, beans, and corn, they were created by the indigenous peoples in the Americas and North, Central, and South America. Uh, these foods ca came from here, and they now make up 80% of the world's uh, crops. So indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population, uh, but we protect 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. So how can we support indigenous knowledges? So uh, a few years ago, I was introduced to El uh, Elder Albert Marshall, and him and his wife had taken uh, Mi'kmaq teachings, and they came up with a term that helped translate those the ideas and the concepts behind their pedagogical practices and their epistemology to uh, make things a little more understandable for the Western world. And they published a paper about two-eyed seeing, which uh, Elder Marshall defines as uh, learning to see from one eye with the strengths of Indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from another eye with the strengths of mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing, to use these ways to go together to benefit all. And this was something that underpinned a lot of the work that we do at the Prairie Climate Center. So with the Climate Atlas of Canada, uh, there was something that uh, the team thought was kind of missing from that. So they had connected with some of the elders and leadership uh, from Indigenous communities, uh, such as the late Elder Dave Kershane and Seal Watt Cluche and uh, Frank Brown, just to name a few. And it was from the guidance of the people that uh, they said that we needed to have a place for Indigenous knowledges on the Climate Atlas. And uh, so through the guidance of the youth, the academic leadership and uh, um, the, the elders from various communities across uh, the Americas, they had a gathering and it was talked about what, what it was that we can do to help share the stories uh, from Indigenous communities. So storytelling is a really key component uh, to the work at PCC already. So, you know, now looking at the Indigenous Knowledge section allowed us to look at storytelling in a, in a kind of a different way. So the Indigenous Knowledge section is broken down into uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and it, it's those terms are just more to, I, I would say, their identification of location. It's like the same; those terms are like saying Asian or European or African. It doesn't actually mean anything other than it's from those locations. So um, First Nations is not an identity. Um, it's just a, a location place. So this was the easiest way for us to break it down in Canada, though, because that's what most people understand. So storytelling is a huge component. And in a world where academia is always text-based, there's a lot missing from it. And text is always who, it's, it's a patriarchal process. So who's at the top, who gets to publish? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best and latest. It just means that they got published. And... Uh, although that's a really important process, it's not the only process. So with the Climate Atlas of Canada, you can actually watch a lot of documentary films from across Canada, people telling the story of the impacts of climate change from different perspectives. But we also have a lot from the Indigenous community. So participatory video research is an incredibly important component to being able to 
look at the impacts and and learn about what the impacts are, uh, not just from a number standpoint. It's a component of research. So the numbers and the data are very important and they're things that we do need, but they're not the only things that that paint a picture for people. And how do we communicate that work to the rest of the world so that, uh, you know, the research that people do that's important can actually be shown. So this also leads us into uh, another part of the, the climate atlas, the health topic. So in the, the health component uh, of the climate atlas, uh, you could, we, we, had, we have a lot of information to help inform Canadians on climate-related health impacts, such as mental health, uh, heat illness, air quality illness, infectious diseases, but also a lot of research that kind of brings uh, the, 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 the components of, of these health impacts, not just from the research standpoint, but also from community and storytelling standpoint. So you can find a lot of papers there that are related to the work that uh, is coming out of this field. But you can, you can also go there to learn more about the overall risks that are impacting Canadians, such as loss of cold, air quality, floods, allergies, diseases, health risks, uh, like heat-related health risks, uh, extreme weather events, and mental health. So communication of these uh, uh, important bits of information is something that's very vital for a lot of people. So how, how can we share the information that we have? What are the things that we can do to sh better share the, the research that we have? And on the Climate Atlas, you can actually go to find uh, the Climate Change and Lyme Disease Communication Guide, uh, something that can help people find ways that they can communicate the, the information better. Also, Climate Change and Health uh, Communication Guide. So it providing provide insights based on the findings from focus groups and surveys, uh, the findings that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, and also some tips on how to communicate uh, uh, the framing around the communication for the messages and goals for the audiences. So uh, there's a lot on the Climate Atlas that can really provide people with an idea about storytelling itself. And storytelling are really important ways to communicate to everybody else. And Indigenous knowledges are some of the best ways that you can access uh, the, the ways to tell stories. And I think at the the Prairie Climate Center, one of the reasons that I spent a lot of time working there is because it's such a great team, a great group of people who've been able to really bridge the gap between uh, education, research, and storytelling. And uh, inclusion of Indigenous ways of knowing has also helped improve the ability to communicate these informations to people. And those are just some of the things that we can learn from uh, communities that we connect to. So uh, again, thank everybody for their time, for lending me their ears and eyes. And I hope that, uh, you know, we've been able to help uh, kind of look at storytelling in a different way and looking at storytelling, uh, look at storytelling uh, through research in a different way. Um, and I hope that uh, everyone can go forward in their work, feeling a little more inspired to do different things, to do their work in a different way. And uh, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to uh, send them my way. Uh, you can also connect to me through my email, through my website, and also through the Climate Atlas. Uh, you can connect to us there, uh, connect to the PCC through the Climate Atlas. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Brett. That was wonderful. Um... Like Brad said, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, Brett, I have a question because I'm a big fan of the, the Climate Atlas and a lot of the work at the Prairie Climate Center. Yeah. Um, any plans to um, update the Climate Atlases in the future? Or um, if you could, is there anything you would like to um, add going forward? Yeah, so the Climate Atlas, we are always looking at um, continually adding and improving to the Atlas itself. So um, in health, we will have some projects coming forward, uh, different research that will be uh, added to the website itself. Uh, even with regards to Indigenous knowledges, we're currently working on uh, infrastructure 
project that will help provide resources on climate risk assessment for First Nations communities. So there are a lot of different projects that we're actually working on. We're trying to add continually. And we're also going to be uh, updating the uh, data that's on the website. And that's something I didn't really touch on here because uh, there there is a data component to the Climate Atlas um, where uh, researchers in particular dealing with risk can actually use the data from there to look at climate projections in the future. So this would be more important to people looking at uh, warming patterns uh, through the climate and how that's going to impact like uh, uh, weather events, how it's going to impact uh, health through infectious diseases. So you can use that the mapping component as well. Um, if we had more time, we could go into that. But again, like I said, you can go to the Climate Atlas and we're gonna be improving the, the user interface as well in the, in the near future. Um, that's something that's, that the team is also working on. And uh, that data is gonna be updated to the latest uh, uh, soon. Uh, but the, the numbers are, it, it takes a long time to go through all the numbers. Those As those who work in data know, um, we, we can't just throw something up. Uh, so the, the team spends a lot of time uh, taking the information and, and making sure that it's uh, up to date and correct and finalized in a way that it'd be easy for people to use. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but nonetheless, really great resources. Um, so I encourage everyone to check out um, those on the, the Prairie Climate website and the Climate Atlas of Canada website. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, first, thank you so much, Brett, for this informative presentation. How can we manage resistance to Indigenous ways of knowledge in our work? Great question. Um, I think it, it really uh, depends on like the, the kind of, I'd say the atmosphere within the workplace, so who, who the leadership is. Uh, really, it comes down to them being comfortable creating new relationships with uh, uh, indigenous peoples, um, especially I think connecting to people who are either in the field that you're working in, or sometimes it can be connecting to elders in the area, but there are a lot of indigenous people who are physicians, who are researchers, who are health specialists, who work in so many different fields. And I think they would be great people to connect to within this context. Uh, but if you're just looking at, uh, in general, like how to uh, the relationship component to Indigenous knowledge is, I think, connecting to elders is a good way to start. And uh, relationship development is really the key component to it. And doing that is just really by connecting to people through conversation. Um, and if you don't know where to start, sometimes going to your universities because they have elders in, that they have in residence. Uh, most universities now do have elders in residence. That's so good places to connect to there. And also um, just really finding out who the Indigenous people are within uh, the fields or the organizations that you're working at and just starting to develop a relationship that way. And I think the biggest component to, to having roadblocks to Indigenous knowledge is mostly comes from um, people, again, the, the stereotyping the knowledge is to being just um, people, are people being hunter-gatherers. Hunter but as you can see in the presentation I just gave, our knowledges go far beyond uh, just simple hunting and gathering. You don't have complex uh, governance systems and societies over tens of thousands of years by being simple hunter gatherers. Uh, so uh, that's something that in my work that I'm I'm really trying hard to change uh, perspectives of institutions and, and uh, racialized uh, systemic uh, racism uh, in in many of the places that I work. Yeah. Some really great work, Brett, and um, thank you for the advice. Some really great places to start as well. Um, we have more questions coming in. What are your projections for climate change in southeastern Manitoba? Oh, that, that would be something that you can actually click on the Climate Atlas to find. Um, we do have data specialists at the Climate Atlas who are kind of better able to contextualize the, the projections if you're talking about the projections and data itself. Uh, as for the impacts, I think that's something that you can, again, uh, look at uh, on the climate atlas. There are usually films within regions that kind of talk about the current impacts. Mm -hmm. um, and then the projections also can be printed out and that information can be utilized with your team members to, to start the, the research on what those impacts can mean for those regions. Um, but uh, in particular itself, it's more 
I, I, that would be kind of out of my wheelhouse because I don't <laughs> know that particular area. Um, but again, you know, that's something that uh, would come on a project to project basis. If we have time to look at one region, then we totally would. But for us, it's mostly about how to give the tools to people to be able to do that work. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess keeping this in mind kind of relates to our next question. Um, when we're talking about this research info and data um, and these specific geographic areas and regions, um, is there data for remote communities available? Yeah. So on the Climate Atlas, the data itself is kind of a little bit more high level. So um, looking at the uh, points, when you click on the Atlas itself, you can see the grid and you can click on any of those grid points, you can increase and decrease the size. But again, that is a lot of the data that has been um, through the algorithms that our data team creates are uh, basically an average over uh, the, the information that's provided for that particular area, but the granular information for a very specific point, that's not on the climate atlas. That's something you might go to climatedata.ca for, because they're a little bit more for the, the the granular on the ground information and but the, a lot of that is a little more um in depth and you'd probably you know have data specialists or climate specialists who would work with you to for that information whereas uh the climate atlas is a very good entry point for people to look at those grids so you can click on the region where your community is and that's not going to give you like specifically that community but it'll give you the the grid and I believe on the atlas, it tells you the size, what uh, the um, sizes of that grid in um, what the scale is. So mm. on the on on the atlas, you can actually see what the scale is. So it helps you interpret what the size would be for that grid. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an average for that region of that area. But the specific data, you'd have to go go to climatedata.ca for that one. Yeah, no, good to know. Thank you. Um, another question here um, and kind of a couple of sub questions. So let me know if you want me to repeat anything. Is math modeling uh, climate change plus health topics a part of the climate atlas currently? Um, if so, how is indigenous, indigenous knowledge considered in this work? And if not, what are some of the considerations for researchers looking to include indigenous uh, stakeholders and collaborators in math modeling climate change research? A bit of a mouth. <laughs> I can repeat yeah, no, if you would like. <laughs> no, no, no. That is very, very complex questions. That's something <laughs> that definitely would uh, the the math modeling, um, you know, uh, with with regards to health topics, it's not really a component of what we do at the Climate Atlas. But we the the tools that are there are meant to kind of help people start to look at what that can be. So a lot of researchers will actually utilize. The climate atlas data in in their in their research um if they're looking at kind of like a broad projection broad uh, perspective of what the projections can be in the near future and when it comes to health related components they'll usually compare that to uh, impacts that are ex currently experienced and they can start to look at what the projected impacts will be uh, based off of what the the data projections are um but with regards to indigenous knowledges and the projections, what we always look to with indigenous component is if you go to the, the Atlas itself, you can actually click on the on the, the button for First Nations communities, Inuit communities, or Métis projects, and it kind of gives you a scope of each of those where those uh, areas are. So we utilize the government's map for reserves, as well as the Inuit communities, and then the, the Métis projects that are currently active with the government. Uh, mainly because the government maps are, uh, you know, usually up to date. And that was the easiest way for us to kind of put the communities down. Uh, so uh, there are communities who do utilize the Atlas to, as an entry point for their, their if they're applying for funds or if they're doing research on health, you can actually utilize the graphs and stuff that are downloadable from the Climate Atlas uh, for your your research. Again, if you're going granular, very specific location that you'd have to go somewhere else for that but this the climate atlas is a good tool for providing that that uh, high level overview of the projections mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, if anyone has any more questions for Brett, feel free to email me and I'd love to get you in touch oh, and get those questions. I just had one quick one. Um, you're talking about OCAP. Sorry, I just... Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Another one came up. Thank you, Brett. Yeah. yeah I just want to answer this one because this Great is question, actually Chris. Yeah. really <laughs> integral to our work. So with regards to anything that we do within in the First Nations communities, Indigenous communities, uh, anywhere in Canada, OCAP principles um, are integral to everything that we do. So if you are on the Climate Atlas and you look at any of the films or if you look at any of the papers published with Indigenous communities, Indigenous knowledge carriers, uh, researchers and academics, the OCAP principles, they are the background for all of that. So um, when anything is done, we make sure that uh, we, we kind of had to rewrite the way the ethics were uh done when we we do a lot any of the projects uh, because you know a lot of institutions can't it's hard for them to kind of understand that they don't own the information mm -hmm. so when uh, in, we're working with indigenous communities it's always with the understanding that they have 100 percent control of everything so we've had instances where elders have passed that we've worked with in film so we've asked if the family wanted to keep them in there it was up to them and they some of them would decide to keep them uh, there are other instances where people wanted people removed from a film um, for various reasons and that was up to the community so you know we we, we abide by the community's requests and uh, and when we do any of the work it's always uh, with the community's uh, consultation we, we they get they get say over anything that we're doing with them Mm -hmm. So, and that goes with, with anything, our research papers, our films, whatever they may be, um, they'll get to see how their information is being used. And then they get to say, what well, if we're, we have it in the right context, we want to make sure that we're really trying to express what they were trying to share. And then if it needs to change, then they tell us how they want it changed. Wonderful. Thank you again so much, Brett. Um, a great way to start us off here at the 2023 IDCC Forum.